What's up, Sandals Church? Hey, hey, my name's Justin McVeigh. I'm one of the pastors here at Sandals Church. I'm so excited to be hanging out with you guys today. How many of you had a great Christmas? Anyone? Good to hear. How many of you got exactly what you wanted for Christmas? Like you open up the box and you're like, Santa did good this year. Ah, oh, that's so good to hear. I'm not even going to ask who didn't get what they want because that could just cause family problems. We don't want that. Did any of you, though, you gave a gift and when the person opened it up, their eyes lit up and you thought to yourself, I am an amazing gift giver. Anyone have that happen? Now, did any of you who had that happen three hours later think to yourself, I wish I had never given that gift? Like, it happens. It's a real thing. I have a buddy who bought his wife one of those Instapot, Crock-Pot things, you know, that, that cooks anything in 2.7 seconds. You just throw it in and it's done. And later that night, he's like, babe, what are we having for dinner? And she was like, oh, oh we're going to have those T-bones, the steaks that we had sitting out. And he's like, oh, you want me to fire up the grill? And she's like, no, I'm putting it in my Instapot. Now, listen, in case you don't know, that just ain't right, ladies. You do not put steaks in a crock pot. It is not how it works. Or maybe, maybe you've got younger kids and you bought them one of those awesome like karaoke machines where, where they just get to sing their hearts out and pretend they are the next Taylor Swift. And you got it all set up and they were so happy. And then about three hours later, you realize two things. One, you realize you now know all the lyrics to every Taylor Swift song ever written. And you're not sure how you feel about that. And then two, you realize that your son or your daughter is not the next American Idol. And that now you need to protect them from themselves and make sure they never sing in public because it is just not pretty. They have no musical talent. Like, I had this happen to me a couple of years ago. We had just moved to Southern California and I thought it would be a great idea to get zoo passes for the entire family. Like I'm like, we're gonna get passes to the San Diego Zoo. It's gonna be amazing. And it would have been pretty good if they were single day passes but I bought C's and passes. Now, some of you animal lovers are, what's wrong with that? That's amazing. That sounds like the greatest dad gift ever. Well, here's the problem. I'm a very much like, get it done, do it once, done, over. Like, I watch a movie, done. I don't, I don't watch movies twice. I've watched it once, that's done, it's checked off the list, no more. Maybe if it's like the greatest movie ever made, I might watch it twice. So when I go to the zoo, this is how it is with me. Oh, lions, check. Tigers, check. Bears, check. And I'm done. Let's go home. So the thought of going to the zoo every other week just was, it was torture. It was like purgatory. And, and to make it worse, my family is like, ooh, lions. Let's sit and watch. I'm like, are you kidding me? They're like, dad, dad, we want to observe the animals in their natural habitats. I'm like, that's what Discovery Channel's for, right? I'm like, go to Animal Planet. I'm like, this is a zoo, not their natural habitats. And my oldest daughter, bless her heart, she is brilliant. She is so smart. She reads nonstop, which means she wants to read every single sign, every single time. Like, like we're, we're already six months in, and we're looking at the lions, and she's reading the sign. And she's like, Dad, did you know lions that live in sub-Saharan plains of Africa? And I'm like, hon, did you know that they, they exist in family units called prides with one male and multiple females? She's like, dad, how did you know? That's exactly what the sign says. Because you've read it to me 13 times already. I know what every sign in the zoo says. So needless to say, I started getting bored about February, right? Every time we'd go to the zoo, I'd be like, oh, man. And I decided that I'm going to make this fun, right? I'm going to amuse myself. I'm going to figure out ways to keep myself entertained. So I'll never forget one day, my little son, Tarek, he's five years old. He has decided that he wants to see the giant tortoises again. Now, just so you know, the giant tortoises are the biggest ripoff at the San Diego Zoo. In fact, I'm not even sure they're alive. I think the zookeepers may have switched them out with statues at some point because these things never move. I swear, every time I would go, it would be in the exact same spot doing the exact same thing. I'm like, all I need is like a wink or something, turtle, to know that you're still alive. 
Like all I'm watching for is like a, like that's all I need, slow-mo wink, nothing. And so Tarek's like, dad, dad, I'm gonna stay here until the turtles move. I'm like, do you plan on living at the zoo? I'm like, I'm not sure that's ever gonna happen. He's like, no, dad, we need to, we need to see the turtles move. I wanna see the turtles move. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I'm sitting there and about 10 seconds in, I'm like, ooh, I know what I'm gonna do. And I sneak off while he's not watching. And I go back and I duck down so he can't see me, but I can see him. And I'm like, oh, this is gonna be good. And I watch and he's got like this sixth sense that kicks in and he starts looking around. And then he starts doing like the side to side and his eyes get all big fears setting in. And I'm sorry, call me a bad parent if you want, but I'm loving every second of it. Like this is way better than the turtles. And I'm sitting back and then his lip starts to quiver. Stop, stop judging me. His lips start to quiver. I'm like, oh, it's about to start. It's about to start. Here it comes. Here it comes. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. And I probably would have let it go on for a little while. But then I looked in the distance and I saw his mom coming. I was like, "Uh oh, I'm about to be in real trouble. So I jump out from behind. Tara, come right here. The hero of the day. He runs to me and jumps up in my arms, and he's just crying. I'm so scared. I feel that wonderful blend of tears and snot all over my neck. I'm like, yeah, this is great. This is awesome. But in that moment, he said something, and I'll never forget it. He said something that was, <clears throat> it was so simple, but yet so deep. And it was so true that it could have only come from the mouth of a five year old child. He pulls his head back and he looks at me. He says, Daddy, I'm not supposed to be alone. And I was like, whoa, Daddy, I'm not supposed to be alone. You know, it's not just true for a five-year-old who thinks he's lost his parents at the zoo. It's true for us at every stage of life, wherever we're at, whether things are going well or things are going poorly, regardless of the relationships we have around us or what's happening, we're not supposed to be alone. But at some point in our lives, as we start growing up, we, we get this idea that, that we're big enough to handle it now, that we're okay on our own. We get this, this independence and this self-reliance that tells us, you know what? I can handle this. I'm okay on my own. I got this. But I'm here to tell you today, God did not design us to be alone. God, he, he never designed us to exist apart from relationship. He, he wants us to have other people around us as we go through life. Listen, we live in a broken world and things are messed up. And throughout the course of your life, you are going to experience pain and hurt and trials. People are going to come in and out of your life. It's going to be a roller coaster. And if you think for one second that you're strong enough to bear that, to go through it alone, you're, you're fooling yourself. About a year ago, I, I started searching. And I started searching for what I coined public enemy number one. What I wanted to do is I wanted to identify the single biggest struggle, struggle that our culture and our society faced right now. In my mind, as a pastor, I was like, man, if I could find the one thing that affects the most people and then I could mobilize our church and, and we could go after it and we could just, we could end that one thing. We could say, man, this is public enemy number one and, and we're going after it and we want to help people who are struggling with this and come around them and radically change them. I thought, man, that would, that would have an impact and, and our world would be a better place. And so I began searching and looking at all the things we struggle with. I, I did research on things like depression and mental illness, on suicide and just this epidemic of, of hopelessness that has begun to spread across I looked at all the violence that our culture is currently enduring and the senseless, the shootings at, at churches and schools. I went with things that I, I thought were a little bit more sinister. I thought, man, maybe it's, maybe it's materialism and it's desire for more that's really hurting our society, that's doing the most harm. I looked at all of the addictions that we struggle with on so many different levels in our desire to fill the emptiness. 
I even looked at physical health issues, thinking maybe it's a, it's a physical issue that's really struggling with, it's really hurting us. And as I went down the list one by one, it was like God was saying, nope, nope, nope. But as I got deeper and deeper, I realized that at the core of each and every one of them, there was a common thread. There was something that, that triggered it, that made it worse, that brought people to the point where, where they struggled with depression, where they struggled with suicide, where they struggled with addiction. And what I discovered is that one thing was loneliness. You see, at some point in their life, something had happened and they decided that they could do it on their own, but then the weight was too much. And as a result of the pain and the hurt and feeling alone, they began to struggle with these things. I mean, it, it's too much. I can't bear this on my own. And depression begins to set in. Or, or, man, no one cares about me. My life isn't worth living anymore. Maybe suicide is an option. I'm so alone. There's no one there. People make fun of me. They don't accept me. So I'm going to get even. You see, at every single level, addiction, I just need to fill the emptiness left. Materialism even, guess what? I just, I need more because I'm empty. Maybe if I have more, I am more, people will like me more and I'll be able to have relationship. Every single one, loneliness came back to the forefront. And I realized the truth that God never created us to be alone. And so that when we're alone, bad things happen because we just can't carry that weight. It's an issue and a problem that goes all the way to the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I'm talking about creation. And, and in Genesis, as you begin to read the creation account, you notice something. Everything God creates, he looks at it and he says it was good. The, the earth and the sky, night and day, it's good. The sea and the land, it's good. He, he creates the birds and the fish, it's good. The animals, Adam, it's good, it's good. But in chapter two, we see something different. Look with me in your notes. At verse 18 of chapter two, it's gonna be on the screens as well. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good. Notice, it is not good for the man to be alone. I didn't design him that way. That's not how this is supposed to be working. I need to do something. I will make a helper who is just right for him. You see, God created us for relationships. Not to be alone, but for relationships, to connect with the people around us, to know others and to be known, to love others and to be loved by others. It is, it is the very core of our existence, our singular purpose. The mission and calling on our life is relationships. It's programmed into our very DNA. It's a part of who we are. It's why little babies, what do they want? They want to be held. They want to be brought close. It's why in our lives, when we have amazing things happen, we want to share it with others. And some of our greatest experiences are times that we spent with others. It's why so much of our life is consumed with what other people think, because there's something inside of us that just desires relationships, desires to be connected with them. Jesus reinforced this in all of his teachings. If you look through everything Jesus said, it all had to do with developing relationships, with how we relate to him, with how we relate to others. In fact, at one point in his ministry, someone came up to him and they're like, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? All of the laws, all of the regulations, everything that we're told to do, what's the most important thing that we should be doing? And Jesus answered very simply, love. Have a relationship, love God and love others. Have a relationship with God and have a relationship with others. He then went on to explain that everything that's been written, everything else he's told people to do, everything else that, that we strive to make happen, our laws and our regulations, he says, it's all about protecting relationships. It's all about advancing relationships and helping you develop relationships because that's what you were created for. That's your sole purpose in life and nothing else is gonna satisfy Nothing else is going to fill the emptiness inside. And if you don't have relationships, you just wind up with loneliness. And loneliness is like a cancer that eats away until it's destroyed you. Now, some of you are thinking, ah, oh, yeah, okay, I get that, Justin, but I got lots of friends in my life. I got lots of family. There's lots of people around me. I'm, I'm not lonely. I don't struggle with that. I never will struggle with that. And I'd ask you just to, to stop for just a second. And think about the people in your life and really evaluate those relationships. Are, 
are they truly real relationships, deep relationships, people who are there no matter what? Or is it just surface level? You see, we live in a society, in a culture that's more connected than ever before. With the technology that we have, we can keep up with people across the world. I can talk to my, my brother in Indonesia at the press of a button, right? And, and we're more connected. We know what's happening. We know what's going on. But at the same time, we are relationally starved. Uh, listen, we are more connected than ever before. And we're still relationally starved because they're not real relationships. Because there's no depth you see, real relationships, number one, require intimacy. Now, intimacy is something that's really been twisted by our society. In fact, you probably have one of two ideas about intimacy. One, you think of intimacy, you think of sex, you think of physical intimacy. That's not it. Two, you think of intimacy as just this, this marvelous thing that I call it love at first sight. Our eyes met across the room. And instantly we knew that we were going to be intimate soulmates for eternity. Like, th those are the two pictures that our world has painted for us, and neither of them are totally true. You see, what intimacy is, is intimacy is two people headed to the same destination, side by side, sharing the burden along the way. Think about that for a second. Two people who are headed to the same place. They want the same things. They've got the same purpose and the same mission. And, and they're enjoying it. They're going on this journey, headed to this destination side by side, arms linked. They're like, we're in this together. And they're sharing the load. They're there to help out each other, regardless of what happens. Uh, in the Genesis account, it's interesting because God creates woman. We see in verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man was slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. Now, I don't know how God did it. Don't ask me. I realize it doesn't make sense, but he did. But he brings the woman. And this is what I want you to pay attention to is Adam's response. Because preachers all the time, I've been guilty of doing it myself. We paint this response as like what I call the caveman response. Like God brings Eve to Adam and Adam's like, <gasps> pretty, pretty, like, but that's not at all what happened. Look at what really happened. Verse 23, at last, the man exclaimed. He's excited, like he knows he's not designed to live alone. He's like, at last, someone we're gonna have a relationship with. This one is bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. She's part of me. We're in this together. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. You see, Adam is excited because now he has someone to build intimacy with. Now he has someone whose purpose is the same as his, who is headed to the same destination. And he's like, we're going to do this side by side, shoulder to shoulder together. We're going to be there for each other no matter what, right? We're going to help carry the load together. You're part of me and I'm part of you and, and we're there, we're in it. And that's what real relationships are about. It's, it's, it's common bond. You see, that's what intimacy does. It, it, it cements the relationship. It's this glue that holds it together. And when there is intimacy in a relationship, it allows for imperfection. It allows for brokenness. Because when you know you're headed to the same destination, you're doing it side by side, you're in it together, you're there for each other to help out however you can, then guess what? You're willing to stick it out when stuff gets tough. You're willing to be there even when the other person falls, even when the other person messes up. And that changes everything. When you can show grace and forgiveness, that brings depth to a relationship. Listen, it's vital in a marriage relationship. I talk to couples all the time who they've, they've just come to this place where they begin to lose intimacy for one reason or another. And, and the marriage just begins to drift apart because guess what? They're headed different directions. They're no longer side by side. They're not sharing the load anymore. But it's not just marriage relationships. I'm, not, I'm telling you, it's not just dating relationships. This is true in your relationship with your kids' parents and parents with your kids. It's, it's true in the friendships that you have in everyday life with the people you work with. If you want a real relationship, there has to be this sense of intimacy. But it's not all that there is. You see, there's a second thing. Real relationships also require vulnerability. It, there has to be this openness as well. I love verse 25. It has become one of my favorite verses in scripture. It says, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. 
Now, I used to wonder, why did God include that little detail? I mean, did we really need to know that Adam and Eve didn't have any clothes on? Like, what, what part, what role does this play in the whole story? Like, God, there's way more important questions I wish you would have answered. Like, I would much rather know what happened to the dinosaurs, right? Like, couldn't you have included that in there? I don't need to know that Adam and Eve were naked, that they didn't have clothes on, they're running around the garden happy. Okay, yeah, that's great. But as I got a little older, I matured a little. I got to the point in my life where I could read the verse without giggling every time I said naked. I, I was like, oh, 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 there's, there's something more there. You see, God is revealing to us the type of relationship he wants us to have. Now, if you've been around little kids, you realize that in a little kid's world, it is a clothing optional world, right? In fact, most little kids would rather be running around naked than have their clothes on. That's just how they are. I, I was home with my kids the other day, and they were upstairs playing, and all of a sudden things got quiet. And if you're a parent, you know when things get quiet, something bad is about to happen. Like it's the calm before the storm. And I'm like, ooh, I'm gonna get on this before something happens. So I go up the stairs and I, I go in, the two olders are in one room and they're playing with their Legos. And I'm like, okay, everything's good here. I'm like, where's your little sister? I'm like, oh, she's over in her room uh, playing with her dolls. She's having a tea party or something. I'm like, okay, that's good. So I, I go around and I open the door. And sure enough, there she is having her tea party with her dolls completely naked. I'm like, girl, what are you doing? I know I put clothes on you this morning. She's like, that's hot. So you took your clothes off. There's a fan right there. No, daddy, I hot. I'm like, you gotta have clothes on. She's like, why? Right? That's with little kids, they're like, why? Here I am, this is all of me, I got nothing to hide. Right? That's how they think. That's, that's why they're completely and totally vulnerable. And if we want real relationships, guess what? That's how we have to be. We have to be willing to show others our brokenness to be open and, and honest with our mess, to stop pretending we're something we're not. That's, that's what being real is all about. It's about being vulnerable. Listen, this may mess up forever, the vision of being real for you, but it's such a great picture. The idea of being real, of being vulnerable, it's the same as being relationally naked. See, being real is being relationally naked. It's saying in your relationships with the people around you, here I am, all of me, the good, the bad, the ugly. And here's what happens. When you do that, when you're real with who you are and someone chooses to continue to love you, to continue to be in relationship with you in the midst of your mess and your hurt and your brokenness, when they still know the real you, that's when the depth of a real relationship comes in. That's when you move from just being Instagram friends to being in a real relationship and that's what God wants for us. And that's the kind of relationship God wants to have with us, even when we mess up. Because that's exactly what we do. It's exactly what Adam and Eve did. And we all know the story. We've heard it before. God says, don't eat. Don't eat of this one tree. There's only one tree. You can have anything you want, but don't eat from this tree. And what do they do? They eat from the tree. Chapter 3, verse 6. She, talking about Eve, saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she thinks, maybe that can fill the emptiness. Maybe I don't need a relationship. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. You see, we think there's something more than the relationship God has for us. And so we leave him behind. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. They decide, you know what? We don't want to go to the same destination as God anymore. We don't need to be side by side with him anymore. We don't need his help anymore. And they break the intimacy of their relationship with God. And they go do their own thing. But it gets worse. At that moment, their eyes were opened. And they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. <laughs> so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, we messed up. We're broken. We're not worthy of a relationship with God anymore. We need to hide. We can't be vulnerable anymore. And all of a sudden, this relationship that was so real and so deep is broken. But here's the good news. It's the good news for Adam and Eve, and it's the good news for every single one of us, that even at your worst, God still wants a relationship with you. Even at your deepest, darkest moment, when you've ran from him, when you've messed up like you've never messed up before, God still wants a relationship with you. 
Verse eight, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord among the trees. Then the Lord called out to man. This is amazing. He called out, where are you? Where are you? Listen, God is calling you. He's calling you. In the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of your hurt, in the midst of your loneliness, he's saying, where are you? I'm looking for you. I want a relationship with you. Where are you? Now, some of us, we hear God calling for us, and we don't think that he wants a relationship with us. I remember coming home from work one day, and I walk in, I'm just tired, and I'm worn out. And I go in to just crash on the couch. And there, on the couch, is this wonderful self-portrait of my four-year-old daughter in red Sharpie drawn on the couch cushion. Mm Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, I was not happy. The steam started rising. My veins started popping out, and at the top of my lungs, I used all three names. Tiddly Amara McVeigh, where are you? Listen, I did not want a relationship with her at that moment. I was going to impart the wrath of her father. But thankfully, that's not how God works. We think that God just wants to impart wrath and punish us, but he said, no, 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 no. Where are you? I'm looking for you because I want to spend time with you. I want to help heal the pain. I want a relationship with you. I want to restore the intimacy. I want to restore the vulnerability. I'm still here. But he just doesn't stop at calling out to us. You see, God is pursuing you. He calls out, and when you don't answer, when you're still hiding, he goes after you. Romans 5, 8 says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ, his son, to die for us. He's like, it's not enough just to call out. I've got to go after them to die for us while we were what? Still sinners. At our worst, while we're still hiding, while we're still broken, while we're still messed up. God says, I still love you, and I'm still coming after you. That's the depth of my love for you. Paul writes about God's love in Romans chapter 8. He says, can anything ever separate us from God's love? It's a legitimate question. Is there anything that I could do, any circumstance that could happen in my life that would be bad enough that God would say, I'm done, it's over, and and God would just walk away from that relationship? (laughs) This is what Paul says, can anything separate us from God's love? Does it mean he doesn't love us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted, hungry, destitute, in danger, or threatened with death? Does it mean God doesn't love us if things aren't going that great in our lives, if we're struggling, if it's difficult, if it's hard? He says, I'm convinced that nothing, circle it, it's an absolute, nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Not death, not life, not angels or demons, not our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, not even the power of hell itself can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing, circle it again, in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There are going to be times in your life when life is tough and there is pain and there is hurt. And many times in those moments, you are going to feel alone. Loneliness is gonna come knocking at your door and you're gonna wonder if anyone cares, if you matter, if anyone's there for you. And those are very real feelings, and I, I will not minimize them at all. I've experienced them in my own life, and it hurts, and it drags you down. But I want you to understand that there is a truth that is greater than those feelings, that there is a truth that's, that's bigger than that pain and that hurt, and that truth is that there is a God who loves you, who is calling out to you, who is pursuing you, and that because of that, you are never alone. That's the truth that God wants you to know and understand. It's, it's the single greatest truth in all of Christianity that you are never alone, that God will always be there for you. You see, God is still there. God is still there when when you mess up. God is still there when your friends abandon you. God is still there when life's hard. 
He's still there when you've lost everything. He's there when other people hurt you, when you don't feel good enough. He's there when you're afraid. He's even there when you hide from him. He's there when you push others away. He's there when you feel like others are attacking you. He's there when life doesn't turn out like you had planned. He's there when you begin to doubt if he even exists and you question your faith. He's there when nothing makes sense. He's still there. He still loves you. He's still calling out to you. He's still pursuing you. He wants you to know that you're never alone. And listen, he wants you to, to know that all you need to do is to stop hiding and to start seeking relationships and he'll take care of the rest. He says, listen, I know things aren't that great right now, but if you'll just stop hiding, if you just come out from hiding, it's okay. I know you don't feel worthy. I know things are a mess. I know you're hurting right now. I, I, I know you don't want to be around people. But listen, stop hiding. Come out of hiding. Come out of hiding. It's time to start seeking real relationships. It's try to, time to start building relationships that will last. He says, listen, start by seeking a real relationship with me, with God. Revelation 3.20 points out how we need to seek this relationship with God. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. First basically says that God's knocking at your door and he brought takeout. He's like, just let me in. I got takeout. We're going to have a good time. I want to be friends. You see, we have this idea of God as some just like grumpy old man. This like cosmic killjoy. God's like, that's not who I am. I'm a God who loves to laugh, a God of joy, a God of peace, a God of hope. And I want to give you all of that. But you got to open the door. I want a friendship. We will share a meal together as friends. Not as a disappointed, angry parent. As, as two people in a relationship that has intimacy and vulnerability. That's what God wants. And, and we make this relationship with God so hard when in truth, it's so easy. Guess what? First thing, you gotta talk to him. He doesn't care what you say. He doesn't care if you're hurt or mad or angry or you're being a little goofy. He just, he just wants to hear from you. It's a little something we have this big fancy church word we use for it called prayer, right? God says, just talk to me. Tell me what's going on in your life. I want to hear. I want to spend time with you. I want to know what your struggles are and what your hurt and what your pain is. I've been there. I've experienced it. He wants to hear us. He wants us to talk to him. And then once you figure out talking to God, then it's time to like listen. It's classic relationship stuff, guys. Listen. You know how we listen to God? There's this thing called the Bible. We open it up and we begin to listen to it. You see, I tell people all the time, the Bible was not meant to be read. It was meant to be listened to because it's God speaking to us. Regardless of the circumstance or the situation, regardless of what you need to hear, what you're going through, the wisdom that you need in your life, the direction that you need, guess what? It's all in there. And if you will open it up and begin reading, God will speak and he'll, he'll be there for you. Just like a real relationship, like a friendship. Listen, every week when you come to church, here's a great way to start. Listen, when we sing those songs, most of them based on scripture, sing along. I know, a crazy idea, huh? But I'm telling you, if you will sing the words, if you will pay attention to them, it will develop a level of closeness because you'll understand that most of those songs are sung directly to God. And you're like, oh, I'm talking with God, this is awesome, right? Or if you, you really wanna get a little crazy, you ready for this? Oh, raise a hand. You know what you're doing when you do that? You're reaching out to God. You're saying, I want a relationship with you. You're being a little vulnerable with the people around you. I don't know what that person's gonna think about me. Just do it. But start that relationship with God. Because once you begin building that relationship with God, then, then you can begin, begin building real relationships with others. You see, that's the second piece of the puzzle. It, that because we weren't designed to worship God alone, we need to build relationships with others. I get it. Some of you have been hurt. Like, I've tried all this, and someone broke my heart. A friend stabbed me in the back. And I'm just, I'm scared, Justin. I'm scared to get back into this. God understands. He was stabbed in the back by one of his best friends. He says, stop hiding. Don't, don't let it hold you back. 
Some of you, you might be where I am right now, hiding behind busyness. You're just too busy to develop real relationships with others. My wife and I talked about it. That we wake up in the morning, we get our kids ready for school, we take them to school, we drop them off at school, we go to work, we work, we get done, we pick up the kids, we bring them home, we feed the kids, we take them to practice, we bring them back from practice, we help them do their homework, we go to bed. We're tired, we're done. We don't have time for relationship. We don't have time to build intimacy with each other. We don't have time to reach out to friends. We don't have time to, to reach out to neighbors. But we gotta stop hiding. It's not the life God has called us to live. And as a result, the longer we go, the, the more loneliness we feel inside of us. And the easier it is to just drift off into a place that's so far from what God wants, where we're alone and without relationship. Listen, Hebrews 10, 25 says, let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. He says, stop just putting it off. Stop making excuses for not meeting together. Just do it. Maybe, maybe you don't even know who to reach out to. Listen, here's the best way. Find a loner. Find someone who's sitting by themselves. Find that person at work who never talks to anyone else. Just go up and begin a conversation. Ask them about their story. Ask them how the holidays were for them. Begin to know them. Begin to build a relationship. Man, hey, reach out to your neighbors. Get to know them. Blame it on Sandals Church, right? Okay, we gave you these cards last week with these random acts of kindness that we're hoping everyone goes out into their community and serves each other and serves their neighbors. Here's what you do. You go over, you knock on the door. Knock, knock, knock. Uh, my church says I need to do something nice for my neighbor. Can I mow your lawn? Uh, sure. Thanks. My name's Justin, by the way. That's, that's all you got to do. And then start a conversation. Ask them a little bit about them. Ask them about a story. Begin to, to build a relationship. I mean, maybe, maybe you just need to join a team here at Sandals Church to get involved in, in one of our amazing teams. We have all of these teams, teams that work with kids, teams that do the worship, teams that are in the parking lot, teams that greet people all over the place. And you know what their one mission is? to make sure people know they're not alone. To make sure that when they come to Sandals Church, they feel like they are loved and they are accepted and that they can be intimate, that they can be vulnerable, that they can be real. Because that's what we want. And believe it or not, church can be a lonely place. I've talked to people who come in and they just, they get missed. No one says hi to them. No one smiles at them in the parking lot. No one sits next to them or helps them find a seat. And they leave and they never come back because they don't realize that church is the place where they can be real, where they can be accepted. We'll make sure that never happens. Or maybe you're already here and you're already on a team, but man, you just need to get in a small group. You see, small groups are these groups of people that we have all over the Inland Empire that meet at homes during the week and at different locations. And guess what? They're all about practicing real relationships, about practicing intimacy, about practicing being vulnerable and being open and real and relationally naked with each other. And we're just figuring it out together. And we care for each other. And we serve each other. And we're growing together. And it's just one of the ways that Sandals Church is, we want you to know you're not alone. Listen, you can go to our website. You can get signed up. We'll get you in a group. You can start a group. Go to the info table. They'll give you everything you need. But, but don't live life alone any longer. It's not how God has designed you. Listen, I firmly believe that if we as Sandals Church would begin living this out, would we, would, if we would just realize, if we would just get it that we're not designed to be alone, that we were created for relationships and we would live in relationships and we would reach out to others who are feeling lonely and we would engage them in relationships. Let me tell you, we would start growing faster than we are. Every seat would be full and we wouldn't be able to open campuses fast enough. That's what would happen because people are lonely. People want relationships. And yes, it sometimes feels awkward and weird. And I'm the most awkward person in the world starting a relationship. But what I've learned is that people don't care because they just want to know they're not alone. So a couple weeks ago, we were doing some Christmas shopping. And my wife, uh, she allowed me to go with her to Nordstrom Rack. Yay! And our kids were there and... Uh, big surprise, I got a little bored. And so I decided, oh, let's, let's make this fun. And I'm over in the men's clothing with my son and he's not really paying attention. And I'm like, 
Oh, yeah. Repeat. Let's do this again. This is going to be fun. It was pretty fun last time. So I go back, and I get behind one of the racks where he can't see me. And I'm watching. And I'm like, all right, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And he's just sitting there and keeps looking, looking at racks, playing, trying on sunglasses. I'm like, this is not working like I planned. It's going to kick in. And I see him look around. I'm like, oh, here it comes, here it comes. But this time there was no fear. His eyes didn't get big. He didn't start like just, just getting all happy dance, crazy feet. Like I was like, what's, what's going on here? So I waited, I waited, and he just went to the next rack. He was all cool with it. I'm like, this is no fun. So I come out from behind. I'm like, hey, buddy. He's like, hey, dad. I'm like, what the, like did you know I was gone? He goes, oh, yeah. I'm like, weren't you scared? And again, as only a child could do. He said, nah, I wasn't scared, Dad. I knew I wasn't alone. <laughs> he gets it. He says, I, I know I'm not alone. And my hope and my prayer for you is that you'll know you're never alone. In the good times, in the bad, when you're hurting, when it feels like no one else cares, that you'll know you have a God who loves you, who's calling you, who's pursuing you. And you know you have a church that is here for you. And that because of that, you are never alone. Let me pray for you guys. God, I thank you so much that you have created us for relationship. A relationship with you and a relationship with others around you. And that God, that you will never leave us alone because of that. God, I pray for those right now who are hurting. Those who feel alone right now. Who are struggling who believe that no one cares and that there is no one there for them. God, I pray that in this moment, they would feel your love, they would experience your presence in a way like they never have before, and they would know that they are never alone. They have a God who loves them and a church who is there for them. God, I pray for those who've been sitting on the sidelines, who've been hiding for whatever reason and not engaging in relationships. God, I pray that you would burden their heart, that you would put a desire within them to reach out, to stop hiding, and to begin building relationships with you and with others around them, that we would live out our purpose, the purpose that you have created us for, and we would experience the joy and peace that you want for us. God, we thank you, and we praise you in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. Love you.